Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I must confess that I was sick for several days, which, you know, somehow made me look like Gary Oldman, but uh, I'm still here, and I am very eager to present you my, uh, the results of my follow-up project on anti-Americanism, which I hope brought some interesting results. As I said, this uh, project is a follow-up of the previous one, which was done exclusively on the country level. And here I uh, use a new multi-level design. What uh, was found in, in uh, my previous study? First, that there are two forms of anti-Americanism. Uh, there is, well, more general or diffuse anti-Americanism, which is, well, more or less uh, basic negative attitudes to the United States and to Americans, and political anti-Americanism, which is a position to certain uh, policies which are applied by American government in the international arena. Uh, then, uh, possibly the most striking finding of, of my previous study is that the relationship between this general anti-Americanism, the, the American sentiments, and uh, the socio-economic development measure, that's HDI, is non-linear, it's quadratic. Uh, then, I found that Muslim societies are more anti-American than non-Muslim ones, and that uh, the, the, the phenomenon of Muslim anti-Americanism cannot be explained uh, by either uh, uh, the presence of authoritarian political regimes or uh, persistence of uh, traditionalist social values in Muslim countries. And the, this last puzzle is something that I am trying to solve now by addressing the, the level of individual attitudes. <coughs> yes, and in order to do that I use the multi-level design individuals and countries. Uh, for this project I use basically the same data which is the Pew Global Attitude Project for year 2007, which is the, the biggest uh, survey uh, ever carried by Pew Research Center in scope. It includes 47 countries, but I use 45. Uh, I excluded the, the United States for obvious reasons and also the uh, Palestinian territories because, you know, there are problems with country-level data on, on Palestine. Uh, what I choose for this study on the individual level, uh, I use uh, first some possible religious factors of anti-Americanism. I am trying to understand whether uh, self-identification as Muslim influences anti-Americanism and the, also the level of religiosity. And then I also use some uh, political predictors, which is uh, attitudes related to the Israel-Palestinian conflict, uh, the attitudes to American presence in Iraq, and some attitudes related to the phenomenon of globalization. Well, and some uh, some controls, which are, well, age, gender, but also values. Uh, I decided not to, uh, you know, feed you with uh, some uh, strictly formulated hypothesis, but here you can see the, the basic questions which I am uh, trying to answer in, in, in this study. Uh, first, I would like to understand whether my whether the, the effects which I found in the in a country level study would be confirmed uh, using a multi level design. Uh, then, uh, since I found that Muslim countries are more anti-Americanism on average, uh, what uh, what's the real root of this phenomenon? Is it, you know, a phenomena of being a resident of a Muslim-majority country, or it's important to be uh, a Muslim yourself to 
identify yourself with Islam as, uh, as a Christian. Uh, then uh, I test a number of hypotheses which are uh, related to a number of religious and political possible religious and political factors of anti-Americanism which were mentioned on the previous slide. And then if uh, these factors are significant, are Muslims more sensitive to them than non-Muslims? So here are the, 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 the four questions which I am trying to, to answer here. Uh, first, uh, uh, according to the, 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 the design of the previous study and my research questions, uh, I you know, somewhat reverse the, the, the usual order of the, the how the multi-level models are tested. I first included country-level predictors and then added the individual level ones. So you can see the model one, which includes the basic demographic controls and the country-level predictors. Uh, what we see is that the major finding uh, from the country level study is confirmed that we see non-linear relationship between anti-Americanism and uh, <coughs> API. Uh, the uh, negative coefficient for the quadratic terms of, for HDI basically means that uh, the, the, the shape is the in, inverse, inverse view, something like that. And, uh, in, as well, the share of Muslim population is also significant and has a well, pretty, pretty uh, high in magnitude. Uh, <coughs> then, for model number two, uh, the only thing which I included was uh, individual level predictor self-identification as Muslim. And uh, what we see here is that the, the country level term for Muslim population immediately became insignificant. So the um, conclusion would be that uh, anti-Americanism is indeed higher among people who self-identify as Muslims. And uh, this is their, uh, well, phenomenon of identity and not the phenomenon of you know, just being a resident of a Muslim country. I think, well, it's, it's interesting and it confirms that uh, the results of my previous uh, study were not some <coughs> ecological fallacy. Indeed, Muslims are more anti-American uh, anti than non-Muslims. Uh, here, just to illustrate the, the, the effect of HDI, uh, the, the inverse U, Curve that you can see because in uh, Chris Walzel in, in his comments to my, the, my report asked uh, about the, the relationship between positive coefficient for the linear term, negative for the <coughs> quadratic term, and uh, well, this is how it, it can be presented on in, in, in the vertical format. So it's the, the well inverse view with, you know, somewhat moved to, to, to the right, I guess, for the left one. Uh, here we also see uh, political anti-Americanism <coughs> with Israel as a huge outlier, which is, uh, uh, has very high HDI. <coughs> But at the same time, it's extremely low on political identity. Wait, so can I ask a very brief clarification? Yeah. Um, so the second graph is saying that the higher the HDI, the more there is issue-oriented anti-American. Yeah. And but it's a linear relationship. Yeah. Oh. Well, that, 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 that's, uh, I do not put much attention to that because that's the result I basically presented in November. Yeah. November was so late, so <laughs> <laughs> try to repeat as much as possible. Yeah, but we okay. have also time. Of course. <laughs> uh, here, 
the, you can see the, the shift from model 2, which, well, uh, you can see that here I don't mention all the, the uh, <coughs> all the effects which were included in my model and, you know, uh, try to focus attention only on the most important ones, but uh, if you are interested in seeing all my models in full, uh, well, I, I, I guess one of those printed texts is maybe mine, if, if, if not, <laughs> uh, maybe you can update it somehow. Uh, what, what we can see here is that even after adding all the well possible factors which can contribute to anti-organism in the first level, the questions such as uh, sympathy with Palestinians, opposition to American military presence in Iraq, opposition to globalization, uh, social traditionalism, and so on, we see that all those factors are actually significant. Some of them are even have, well, rather strong effect. Uh, for instance, the, the Iraq war, well, I would say very strong effect, but even after adding these, uh, these items, the uh, direct effect of Muslim identification on anti-Americanism actually persists. So, uh, the conclusion is that, well, uh, political factors contribute to anti-Americanism indeed, but this cannot explain the anti-Americanism among Muslims. But then, in the next model, uh, and I must uh, uh, one more time thank Chris Galsel for his suggestion that possibly Muslims are more sensitive to uh, uh, political questions. And this model basically says that, well, yes indeed, they are more sensitive. When we, I included interactions with all the uh, possible political and uh, <coughs> religious factors, uh, we see that, you know, for all questions, uh, Muslims are indeed more sensitive. For instance, if someone, uh, well, I don't know, Orthodox Christian is uh, sympathetic with Palestine, not with Israel in, in the Middle East, he or she would be more anti-American. But if uh, a Muslim holds the same opinion, he would be even more anti-American. Uh, another interesting question is religiosity. That in general, religious people are not more anti-American than non-religious. But if we consider Muslims, Religious Muslims are more anti-American than non-religious Muslims, which is also interesting. So, the, the major uh, conclusions from this is that, uh, first, Muslims are more sensitive to certain American policies, but religious factors still play a role, and the direct effect of Muslim identification on anti-Americanism do not go away uh, completely, although it becomes much, much lower in both significance and magnitude. <coughs> Here uh, you can see the brief discussion of the results put on, on, on one single slide. First, uh, my country level results are completely confirmed uh, on the multi level design, which is great. Uh, then, uh, another thing is that the, the phenomenon of anti Americanism among Muslims is not an ecological fallacy, which is fine as well, because th these are all the results which I present in a paper based on my. my, my previous project and it's, it's, it's great that, you know, I'm not trying to uh, actually apply to my readers. Uh, then, uh, the answers which are uh, 
related to this project only. First, American policies indeed contribute to anti-Americanism, but at the same time they can they do not directly mediate the, the, the effect of uh, Muslim identification on anti-Americanism. If we uh, think of single most important factor which damaged the, the image of the United States in the world, it would be the, the war in Iraq, or now, well, American presence in Iraq. Uh, then uh, Muslims are indeed more sensitive to the, all the political questions which are usually associated with anti-Americanism, war in Iraq included. And finally, the religious Muslims are more anti-American, and this effect, the positive relationship between religiosity and anti-Americanism, was not found for the adherence of other religions. And, you know, making two most general conclusions that, well, indeed, if we, you know, just sum up the, the magnitudes of effects, we will see that anti-Americanism among Muslims is primarily driven by political concerns. <laughs> but, uh, and, yeah, and most importantly by the war in, in, in Iraq, which its magnitude is uh, like three times, times higher than any other, really. Uh, but the religious factor still plays a role in, in, in the whole uh, phenomenon. We see that, uh, first, religious Muslims are more anti-American, and yes, this, uh, this is an effect which we don't see for any other uh, religion which was, well, included in, in, in the Pew uh, Global Attitude Story. Well, this, that's, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And you even save several minutes. And uh, I will continue non-democratic traditions set by Eduard. And uh, yes, and we will use the appointed critiques, not spontaneous one. So the editor, please, uh, Veronica, please start. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, so, uh, it really does not seem to me that I can actually add something to this uh, project. And, yeah. <laughs> this so, brilliant project. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I really only have questions, not, not really suggestions. So, I think I will give the space to Afron. Thank you very much. Very complimentary. <laughs> Roman, please. I will try to be as congenial as Monica. Uh, very interesting presentation. The most interesting thing to me was this curvilinear relationship between general and Americanism and the U.S. Development Index. Could you show exactly which countries? Uh, I would love to see the country labels that might help explain it. It's uh, not the sort of Finding that I can see any obvious reason why this relationship would be curvilinear. Could you tell me exactly which countries are clustered at the high end in the middle? Uh, well, uh, what I definitely know is what the you know three countries, which are you know the, the, the three highest ones, are uh, Turkey, Pakistan, and Argentina. On the here on the top or on the <coughs> which point the exact dots? Yeah. No no here on, on the very very top ah. part of the ground. Okay, and the next three or four are which? Well there's uh, a whole cluster of very I mean, the, the high point of the graph is in the middle. So this is the pattern is dominated by those. What are the other four? Well uh, I would not Lie, although I can seem uh, a bit, you know, not politically correct, but most of them are Muslim countries. Okay, I would expect that. Then at the low end, uh, one of the countries that are there are about four countries that are at the low end on the high, high end of the government index and law and Americanism. Which countries are those? Uh, which are high on human development law and human Yeah, well, they're right. Yeah. Right at the edge, sort of below the regression line. Well, uh, here, well, it, it's easy to guess that there are most of the right there. There are, well, uh, European countries and then Canada. Okay, what you might be picking up is Islamic countries tend to be in the middle. Yeah, but I control for the, the uh, variable for religious composition of the model, yeah. and the, the, the quadratic okay, effect you know, remained uh, significant. And you had Argentina in this group, which is not Islamic. But, yeah, okay, Argentina is the outlier, but the others are Islamic. Uh, this pattern is not controlled, is it? This, this particular graph does not control for the W variable. Yeah, the, the, the graph is not, but the, the quadratic effect is controlled. How much weaker is it? I would assume it's considerably weaker. Could we, could we see the regression? Yeah, I'd like to see the regression line controlling for the dummy variable because... Well, yeah, here you, you can see the, the linear effect and the, the quadratic one and the, the effect that it's controlled for the percentage of mass negotiation. Uh, huh? And not controlled for Muslim population. What I'd like to compare the quadratic uh, coefficient controlled and not controlled for Muslim population. I would think that a big part of this, obviously, Muslim population is a big factor here. So I think uh, I would think that that quadratic effect might apparently it still persists, though at a considered at a, at a low, lowish level. Um, in fact, do you have that? I would like to see, I would assume that the quadratic figure is a lot stronger when you don't control the Muslim population. Mm, that's, that, that, that's possible, but here I, I, I don't have this. Okay. Uh, this figure, uh, because basically it's a part of, of my previous project. And in, in, in this one, I concentrated specifically on the individual level efforts. The, the uh, country level, you know, I, I, they were basically, it's copied somehow from my uh, November presentation. 
Okay, well, the, so to me, the most striking finding here is this really sharp, when you don't control for the Muslim population, you get a really sharp quadratic effect, which is unusual and therefore interesting. And uh, my interpretation is it's probably a lot less striking when you control for the fact that Muslim countries tend to be in the middle. Wait, wait a second. Is that the human development index? I thought it was scaled 0 to 1. It's standardized. Oh. Sorry. Okay. Well, that was uh, sort of, that, that mystery is compelling. The other findings I don't find surprising. Uh, basically, Islamic countries at this point in time, I'm not sure, uh, how much this will hold up forever and ever. But when the US was violently engaged in Iraq, Islamic countries were, became, uh, Islamic populations became anti American, which is one of the many consequences of the intervention in Iraq. I think uh, I, it will be interesting when you get data from later time points whether to see whether this holds up. But, uh, the basic finding that Iraq did not make us beloved among Islamic countries is not a huge surprise. Simply in terms of there's a lot of evidence, and I'm sure your findings are right. Uh, again, it, another interesting finding is uh, the fact that it is Muslim identity, not living in the Muslim, in the predominantly Muslim society is the important thing. That's not at all self-evident, and it's interesting as you find that. Quite often, the national atmosphere is the dominant driving force in this case. Apparently, it's only the Muslims in Muslim majority countries who get that. Last point, uh, the religious Muslims around America, though this is not true, but it's not religious people are generally anti-American which would imply a kind of the U.S. is decadent and rotten. It is specific, it is Muslim specific, which implies, which focuses it all the more that this is American invasion of an Islamic country who is not popular with Muslims. So it's an interesting finding. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we still have several minutes for the democratic question. <coughs> Please, Shaban. Thank you very much. I appreciate this is a very interesting paper. I'm pretty, uh, this is a very interesting paper. I think it uh, <laughs> provides a very you know, powerful basis for thinking about the origins of anti Americanism and uh, what is the sixth of the whole population. Uh, and given recent events, it seems all the more pointed. Uh, so thank you very much. I think it's a very interesting paper. I think that you would definitely have the right choice by proving this is not a uh, ecological fallacy by going to the individual. So that's definitely a, a good step to, to have made. Uh, I have two um, semi-comments, semi-questions. I'm not entirely sure what they are. Um, the first, I'm, I'm very concerned that generally Muslim countries are over 95% Muslim. So I'm concerned with collinearity between uh, individual level Muslim ID and uh, country level uh, Muslim country uh, tag. Right, so presumably, I would guess that 95% of the respondents that have Muslim ID, that uh, have a Muslim country, have also Muslim ID, not the other way around, sorry. So um, I wouldn't be as convinced that that's the effect. Although, Given that you're using a multi-level model, that probably uh, um, helps you a little bit. My, my second comment is that, uh, could you go back to the previous uh, two, two pages, two slides prior? Um, make that free for, for a second. All right, so what you have here is a dependent variable that you say is standardized. So it's minus two plus two or something like that. Um, and we have 
a the HDI, sorry, the explanatory variable is, is standardized. Uh, it's normally from zero to one. You expand it to be from minus two to plus two. Right? And now we have an HDI linear and HDI quadratic relationship. <coughs> Um, without seeing the intercepts, um, I can't say I know how the, the, the graph actually looks the way you, oh, you the, drew it. I mean, because, um, because just, just a second. Because, uh, first of all, half of the HDI values are negative, and a large percentage of them are actually between 0 and 1, between minus 1 and 0 which does funny things when you do quadratic uh, formulas on them. So I'm not, perhaps I haven't thought about it enough. It's quite possible and it's, um, I've had too much coffee and I'm not thinking straight. It's, it's very, very possible. But I'm not as convinced that the graph actually looks like that U-shaped relationship. I'd have to think more on it uh, to be convinced. Sure. Perhaps you can answer that. Sure. Eddie, please, Eddie. Thank you very much. First of all, please make it in more compressed form. Sorry for the First of all, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I have to begin with a question. When you talk about religiosity, are you talking about a dichotomous variable that is Muslim or non-Muslim, or how do you measure this variable? How do you define this variable? Uh, well, I have two variables. Uh, one what? is Muslim IE. No, the other one. Uh, religiosity. And the religiosity is, well, uh, zero non religious, and one is religious. It's the self description of the respondent whether he or herself has Okay, so it's, the, it's a zero one. It's a yeah. dummy. It's a yeah. dummy. Okay. I'll tell you why, why, why I'm asking. On Sunday, when I speak about my topic on attitudes to the law and the legal system, trust and legitimacy, <coughs> etc., especially in the Israeli data, in the Israeli part, I'm using a religiosity variable, a religiosity indicator, okay? And based on a lot of experience, especially with measuring religiosity among the Jews, okay, where we have observant, non-observant, orthodox, non-orthodox, I mean, we found that it's not necessarily a dummy variable, it's a kind of a scale that you can measure. And therefore, we have applied it also to Israeli Arabs, to Muslims, and we find it very, very useful. I'm not sure if you can very easily apply it in Europe with this kind of data, but I wouldn't be surprised that if you will be able to develop a kind of a scale of religiosity, and not necessarily like I'm totally non-religious or non-observant, scale of one to five or something similar to this, I mean, that it will become much more powerful in terms of its uh, explanatory power. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Christian, you. please. Yeah, I wanted to uh, second Sherborn, um, even though it's a technicality, but it's important. If you have standardized the HDE scores before you calculated the quadratic term, that means that countries that are low on HDI will after uh, quadratic term be very high. So this is something uh, you should you should look at. Um, for for if you send this for review, um, uh, I strongly advise you label the dots because reviewers want to see exactly what Ron said before, which countries are located <coughs> where, uh, in order to see if the the distribution is not driven uh, by a couple of cases and you don't have. Um, so many, and for, for, for this matter, I would tone down uh, the quadratic effect a little bit more. I would rather use formulations that say what I have suggests, rather than this is a very, very strong finding, because it is just significant anyways. It's not like highly significant, right? You had put one asterisk on it, so to me that indicates it's just crossing the, 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 the hurdle. Um, I would, however, underline very much um, your other finding, which I think is, is most important here, that the uh, individual identification as a Muslim is more important than living in a majority Muslim society. So it's not just the environment, but it has something to do with the identity. In fact, it resonates very much with a paper uh, I did with Amy, uh, where we looked at patriarchal values as the dependent variable <laughs> in fact, um, our, attention, our intention was to explain away 
uh, the Muslim effect. So we did everything uh, to find controls under which um, the Muslim individual level variable would have no effect anymore on patriarchal values. And we cut groups, we tailored them into like all kinds of combinations. Young woman with high education, not married, is there still a Muslim effect on patriarchal values? Yes, it was. We could not make it go, uh, whatever you threw in the equations. Um, and this seems to be the case here too, and I think that is probably something that, that is a valid finding. Thank you. Just a short comment, Samuel Huntington wrote a book which is called The Clash of Civilizations. And maybe you are just picking up signals from civilizations. Uh, this is a joke. <laughs> However, uh, if maybe um, the, the difference or the anti-American attitudes stem not from the political level to which you are trying to explore level of countries or even religiosity, but from the difference in the attitude to the basic values of life, like family, um, or let's say ways of communicating between people, or you know, food, or anything like that. So uh, to confirm or reject <coughs> the hypothesis of civilizational difference, you have to explore that. Maybe that's one of the avenues of analysis that you can uh, use in your paper. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, one minute, the, the two, two, or two minutes, you know, but, uh, first, that I, of course, I have checked for the robustness of the quadratic effect of HDI, uh, including, uh, you know, uh, making the, the same equation without standardizing it, and the quadratic effect persists. So it, it, it's clearly, you know, not a some stupid mistake. I don't make stupid mistakes. <laughs> Great. Then, uh, the, the intercept is zero. It's, uh, well, uh, as well, I didn't consider it important information to mention here, but it's zero. If everything is standardized, the intercept oh, is everything zero. Is everything is standardized. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, and uh, about the, the, the importance of uh, values which uh, Professor Chernish addressed, uh, well, the only one value thing which I have here is traditionalism. What we see is it's, well, it's uh, gender traditionalism, being <coughs> specific. And we see that, you know, well, it's significant, but uh, the the effect is relatively small, so the the, the you know differences in, in values according to my results uh, do not contribute much to anti-Americanism among Muslims. Although it's the the view data which is well relatively poor on, on the, the the values question, so I I am uh, limited in, in uh, possibilities to do that. Uh, also, I am limited in the uh, religiosity measure. So basically, I use the, the, the item which is provided in uh, in, in, in view data, which is uh, well, it has well, basically it has four categories. But in, in the lowest, there are like I don't know 500 people out of 50,000 in, in in the sample, and uh, well. Uh, also, I just well, would like to, to thank everyone for the comments and suggestions because I uh, think that it will help me to, to improve the, the, the project to the, the next conference in August, if I'm not mistaken. They will, everybody will forget everything, so you can repeat and then... It happens every time. Thank you very much, and uh, we do not trust you. But you are not trusted. And you will recover very soon. Maxim Rudiv, please. Uh, the floor is open. And Maxim will tell us about value consensus and social economic development. Oh, no. <coughs> oh, 
much about the social economic development, but much of uh, other consensus. Uh, uh, in comparison with uh, what I presented uh, initially in November, uh, I made some progress, and the most of this progress uh, was uh, adding the nation to the title of, of my, my project. Because, uh, uh, because <laughs> because value consensus is actually uh, very accurate to be very uh, broad topic. Uh, well, why I had it mentioned? Because I tried to make it a bit more precise, a bit less broad. Uh, because the consensus can be uh, uh, found uh, in every group, even between two people, and there are some papers on the value consensus between married couples. So we are not interested in married couples, we are interested in social economic development, right? And the societies and groups which are a bit more significant. Um, well, there is a very old tradition of uh, looking for different kinds of uh, commonalities in society. Uh, starting from Durkheim, Solidarity, Gemeinschaft, Gesellschaft, everything. Every uh, social theorist uh, tried to say something about it because uh, it's actually the topic of research and uh, political science in general. Uh, and on the other uh, pole, there is atomization, the consolidation, this sense of differentiation and sometimes conflict, which is uh, uh, consequence of, <coughs> of uh, dissensus and uh, of all other kinds of division, lack of uh, communities. One of the problems in uh, studying the value consensus is that the, most of the literature is really outdated. In the 60s, 70s, most of the works, when Parsons was uh, uh, in trend. And a lot of uh, empirical uh, scientists try to uh, operationalize these uh, terms. Um, and then, uh, for some reason, uh, the, the whole discourse of consensus disappeared. Uh, my guess is that it, it occurred because the uh, conflict paradigm took uh, its strength. Uh, and, uh, uh, to destroy this um, uh, <coughs> this concept, um, but I, I think there is still uh, enough uh, sense in, in, in this concept uh, to study more. So I kind of revived this general concept. Uh, Parson stated that high value consensus in society provides sustainable social order. It was very very theoretical, very speculative <laughs> notion uh, of which he was criticized most because he was uh, very unprecise in what is value consensus, what is values in, in this uh, sense. Uh, so so uh, people from the conflict party like Tarantorf uh, criticized it and the Marxist criticized it and said that uh, there should not be consensus in the society, there should be conflict, only. this is the only way the society can develop or go to work. Uh, it depends. Well, as, as I said, the, the, the literature is quite outdated. I, I'm going forward straight to the, my definition of value consensus, which is very simple. And uh, the value consensus, from my point of view, is a similarity of values in a group of how similar values are, just just it. Or it, it might, and this it might depend um, on uh, definition of value itself, the uh, values, and if uh, if I accept um, the definition of Schwartz, it can be reformulated as a degree to which end goals of individuals in a certain group are similar. Because for Schwartz, uh, values are end goals. Uh, an important thing is what value consensus is not. Um, 
Uh, first of all, one consensus is not consensual. Uh, uh, is not uh, essentially independent of <coughs> value importance. Value importance is different thing. The, the, the level on, on which we agree uh, may be hey, we may agree on the high importance of uh, say self transcendence. And we may all in this uh, room may agree with uh, uh, about the very low uh, importance of so, uh, another thing is that value consensus is not a social cohesion. That was a lot of the questions uh, in my last uh, report. Because uh, social cohesion is quite vague and uh, understood as unity of either in, in different studies, either behaviors, norms, values, anything, just some common edge uh, or, or thinking or whatever. Something in common, which, uh, which can be uh, in different ways uh, uh, connected with value consensus. And value consensus around only certain values not lead to social cohesion. So value consensus by itself is not, uh, is not a virtue uh, but it's for the development. Uh, for instance, consensus around egoistic values, if we all agree in that, how interests are the first of all, and we do not care about all others, but we all share this uh, this attitude of this value. Uh, this may lead to erosion of the cooperation and not to cohesion, not to some common protection. Uh, well, the research questions of this study is um, the first: what kind of groups impact international value consensus? So I, I focus on the national value consensus. What kind of group impact uh, international value consensus or the census? It, it doesn't matter here. Uh, and second, what are the correlates of high and low national value consensus? Very, very, very simple questions for the first stage of my study. Then there are four hypotheses. Uh, first, overall value consensus in a country is positively related to its economic development. Well, uh, on the certain values, of course. I should have read it. Uh, because uh, <coughs> the more consensual group has um, more common goals. And if we agree about goals, we are more successful in uh, pursuing our goals. Right? Uh, country and generation are the most powerful factors of value consensus. Uh, um, country. Uh, well, country is just assumed to be a, well, it's, it's more or less obvious that country <coughs> is some other consensus. And it might be checked, of course. And generation, I, I based this hypothesis on impacts, uh, findings uh, about uh, generational gap, which leads to the uh, value change and which uh, involves uh, some social economic change. And then uh, two other hypotheses uh, connected with um, uh, with the level of social economic development. Uh, in developed countries, the most consensual groups are social classes, and in transitional countries, the most consensual groups are generations. This uh, this hypothesis uh, I was able to to test, and another one which which follows in this group. Uh, it's, it's a great in developing countries. I, I did study uh, developing countries at you know, this stage. But my, my expectation is that in developing countries, the most essential groups are religious, ethnic, or uh, original groups. So, kind of Italian um, solidarity. That's a very good reason. I used the data from European Social Survey, five fifth round. 27 European countries. Uh, and uh, value categories uh, developed by Schwartz is ratio of the change of the and of the uh, Well, if, in further steps, I, I plan to expand this to, to, to more measures of values and more, include more countries. But that's, that's kind of exploratory stuff, right? Uh, indicators of value consensus. Uh, 
uh, uh, I was proposed to use a coefficient of variation, but uh, it wasn't quite appropriate um, and because it depends on the number of groups, which might differ between, for example, uh, 10 social classes and 4 denominations in that country, uh, it's relative to uh, the mean itself. Uh, and conceptual uh, polyconsensus is not connected to the mean importance of value. So we have to reject this coefficient of variation as a measure of value consensus. Uh, Intergrass correlation and statistics were, were rejected too by, by all more or less the same reasons because they involve uh, the, either overall variance, either uh, within group variance. And it may uh, differ between groups, between countries, and uh, I, I was I, I tried to find some measure which doesn't depend on the, for example, country, uh, country variance of uh, so, so I came to the conclusion that standard deviation is, uh, is the best measure. Uh, standard deviation between individuals within country or standard deviation between groups within country. So it's just uh, how groups are different within country in terms of values. Uh, and I have very few results for the moment. Because, because I tried to have various kinds of models and uh, none was satisfactory for me because uh, there was a, a lot of a lot of limitations with that, uh, connected with uh, starting <coughs> with explaining variance variance by itself not not, not just uh, some variables. Uh, first, uh, uh, I look for uh, sources of value consensus, or in, in, in other terms, it's uh, what social groups are input to a national value consensus, or just what predicts values better. Uh, to put it simply, uh, conceptually, uh, uh, value consensus uh, concept, uh, I, I, I found that. Analysis of variance is, is the best one. Uh, and I used the univariate animal model, which is uh, just the usual ANOVA, which allows for many predictors, not only one. And here are the results uh, in terms of virtual data square, uh, well, effect size. Just, I, I do not go to, to the details of, of, of this question. And we can see that age, uh, disregarding the the country, even the country, is the most powerful um, grouping, uh, absorbed grouping, which uh, which impacts into, into the importance of values.